Okay. Hello, welcome. If everyone wants to just kind of grab a seat, we're about to get started here. Welcome again to Grubhub for the second combination Chicago Kotlin user group and Android listener meetup. <laughs> First off, I uh, just want to go over some basic uh, things about, about our groups. Uh, we believe in being inclusive, be curious, ask questions, avoid assumptions, um, and just continue to grow trust, empathy, and friendship amongst each other. Um, we're two different meetups coming together here today, so take the opportunity to meet new people. Um, a little bit about Chicago, Chicago Kotlin user group. We are on the Kotlin Slack under the Chicago channel. We're on Twitter, and um, Meetup is where we organize all of our events. So if you want to learn, if you're more here for the Android uh, listener side of things, um, and you want to learn a little bit more about Kotlin, feel free to join us and come as well. Um, also, you can volunteer to talk. We're always looking for um, more talks, and it's a great way to expand your network, practice a talk, um, and you know, boost your resume. Um, so we are also partnering with um, Chicago GDG Google Developer Group to host a Kotlin Everywhere conference here in Chicago, August 23rd. Um, tickets are on sale now; they're ten dollars. Um, they may be going up in price as we get closer to the event, so make sure to grab them soon. Um, CFPs are no longer open, actually. Uh, they just closed this week. Uh, we have a lot of good submissions, and we're going to be sorting through them, so I'm very excited for the talks that we're going to be having. We're also going to be having a code lab and um, some lightning talks. Um, so you can buy uh, tickets. Uh, you can get there by going to chicago.kotlineverywhere.com. Um, Android listener, welcome. Um, I Graham represents them. Do you want to say anything? Or okay. Hey guys, uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I don't have uh, much to uh, add here. I would just say that um, our next meetup is going to be the third Wednesday in August. And if anyone wants to know when that is, I'm going to look it up right now. Uh. I'm going to attempt too slowly. Is that it? Oh, winner, yes. So August 21st, um, we will be right back here again. Uh, please come out and join us. Um, schedule is to be determined. I know we had at least three volunteers um, at our last meeting, so um, we'll have to fight over who gets the two slots. Um, but I guarantee a fun night of Android um, food and drink. So please come back out and join us. Um, we meet every third Wednesday of the month. Oh, oh I can do this too. This is great. Um, okay, so uh, bathrooms here are really great. Um, women's is uh, right here on the right. Uh, men's is always down this hallway and on your right, right before the glass door. Um, uh, photography and video disclaimer, um, we are currently recording right now the second, it is happening. Um, we are only pointing the cameras at the front of the stage, so if you are kind of behind this line or so, you will be fine and off camera. Uh, feel free to enjoy yourself and relax, um, but we will be recording the presentation. Um, just FYI, if you have a problem, please uh, come find us. Um, uh, welcome to Grubhub. Um, it's an amazing place to work. Uh, are you looking for a job? Do you want to help us out and make uh, delivery great, make restaurants great, uh, and feed people? Uh, we need your help. Uh, we need your help in a lot of different areas. Um, Java developers, Android engineers, Kotlin engineers. Uh, we could use everyone's talents. Um, all right. And without further ado, our main presentation tonight. We have Rick presenting Coroutines. First, Android architecture.
this guy? One mic? Oh, uh, it's gone. Nice. <laughs> it was hidden. All right, we'll figure it out. So there's this uh, option in Mac OS to like automatically chime every 15 minutes. I always forget to turn it off. That's not good. So there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of Twitter rants about me being a 10x engineer over the weekend. Uh, that's not me. So hi, uh, I'm Rick Basaro. Um, I'm an Android developer at Milwaukee Tool. I've been there for three years. Um, I don't like this. Before that, I was an iOS developer, but I'm, I'm better now. Uh, that's not, not that's part of my past. Um, so uh, Milwaukee Tool, we started using, uh, so Milwaukee Tool is a, a power tool manufacturer. We've been around for 100 years, um, and uh, we're an industry leader in that. But uh, lately, we've been making smart tools as well. So they're, they're uh, Bluetooth enabled, and uh, you can connect to them with your smartphone and set RPM or maximum torque. Um, there's a tracking component. There's an inventory component. There's a bunch of stuff. Um, so uh, we're industry leaders in, in that as well. Um, DeWalt is kind of copying us, but not doing all that well. Um, so if you have any questions about that, you can ask me afterwards. I'm going to stop talking about that now. But my team at Milwaukee Tool, um, we've been using coroutines for, in production for a little over a year and a half. Um, as soon as Kotlin 1.2 came out and we were able to start using Kotlin in Android Studio, we immediately switched to using coroutines. I think it was like 0 0.18 at that time. Um, we had a conversation with um, my boss and, and uh, said, you know, look, Roman Elizarov said there's not going to be any breaking changes. He's a liar. But, um, <laughs> you know, we, we trust JetBrains. We... Uh, uh, we can use this API. It looks like it's really good. And that was um, made a lot stronger of an argument since I had already been using coroutines in utility apps since uh, Kotlin 1.1 came out, which was the previous March, which means that I've been writing coroutines for 27 months, 28 months. Um, coroutines have changed a lot in that time. Um, somebody said a few weeks ago that... Uh, you, know, you look at the coroutines API now, and you see that uh, there are all kinds of different opinions about whether you should be using producers or flow or um, actors or um, the architecture component stuff, which is absolutely not in production yet. And uh, that's really difficult. But for somebody who started really, really early, it's kind of like what Jake Wharton is doing with Dagger. Uh, he thinks that Dagger is super easy because he knew about Dagger when it was like in alpha. And uh, coroutines is kind of, I have that perspective with coroutines. So let's talk about coroutines then. Um, that's the start of the talk. Uh, oh, I guess I should say I'm Rick Basaro. I said that. Um, and I'm R Basaro at uh, Slack, Medium, Twitter. That's the Kotlin Slack. Um, and we're, talk, we're here to talk about my favorite thing ever, which is architecture. Um, when you talk about architecture, you're talking about architecture components with Android. And when you're talking about architecture components, you're talking about live data. Um, every talk, every uh, Medium article, every uh, tweet or, or Reddit post or anything that you read about um, MVI, PC, MVM nowadays is going to be talking about how to do that with coroutines and live data. There's always this inclusion between uh, between your architecture and live data, is the live data is this magnificent thing that solves all of life's problems. Um, 
That's absolutely not the case. So we're going to talk about live data first. Say you have some view model with a live data. Um, you've got immutable live data that you can mutate, and then you've got a live data that you are exposing elsewhere. Um, you're not doing anything with it, so let's add something to it. Um, we're going to populate it with the entirety of the winds of winter, um, which isn't actually released yet. That's supposed to be a joke. Um, how do you do that? Well, or rather, how do you how do you consume that in your in some screen in your fragment or in your uh, activity in your OnCreate? You add an observer and uh, you you wait for a change and then you update it, right? But this is asynchronous. Uh, when you're getting the winds of winter, you're going to be firing off some web request or some database request or, or something, and you're going to be waiting for that to finish, and then you're going to be updating your, your, your live data. Um, in this case, obviously, we're just using thread.sleep, and thread.sleep is mimicking what you'd be doing in, in that actual stuff. Um, so now, uh, how are you? Instead of just returning that from your live, from your repository directly, instead your repository is going to be returning a live data, um, and it would look something like this, where you'd initiate a, initialize a mutable live data, and uh, then you do your web request, and then eventually you'd you'd be returning it immediately. But then after you do your web request, you still have your reference to it, and then you're going to be going to be returning it. Um, so instead of having a, li a mutable live data. Why don't you just return the mutable live data that you got directly from the repository to your view model? That way, you're you're eliminating that uh, that extra property. Problem is, this is all happening on the main thread. When you initialize your view model from your screen, from your fragment, from your activity, you're on the main thread. Then, when you initialize your your view model and you call the init block and you do whatever it is you're going to be doing uh, in order to populate this uh, live data, you're still on the main thread. So then in your repository, you're like in this slide right here, you're doing thread.sleep on the main thread. And clearly you can't do that. So instead you add a callback. This is something that retrofit does for us. Literally everybody here uses retrofit, I'm sure. Maybe one guy uses uh, Ktor. Um, but what's the problem with this? Well, now you're going to be updating the, the value. You're going to be do, calling set value for, on your live data from a background thread, right? So instead, you use post value. So you've got this, which looks perfectly natural, and you're, you're going to look at this in, in a pull request, and you're going to be totally fine. Uh, you're going to think it's great. You're going to approve it, move on. What you actually need is that. So this this immediately there's a there's a quote from Josh Blosh from um, from a, a blog 11 years ago. He said APIs should be easy to use and hard to misuse. This is the opposite of that. The uh, in Kotlin you're going to write set value and it's going to tell you write write value instead, and the IDE is going to tell you to use the wrong property. Right, the, the wrong setter. Instead, you have to call this other function. Hate it passionately. So what if you want to, so that's, that's strike number one against live data. What if you want to manipulate the data um, in some way before you're actually displaying it? So Winds of Winter, um, George R. R. Martin really loves uh, a particular phrase. He says half a hundred like all the time. So what if you wanted to get this giant string, which would be an entire novel, which pretty sure you can't do in Java anyway, um, and uh, you wanted to split it uh, for, for every time it says half a hundred. Um, well, this is what it would look like in your view model. You would use a transformations.map, um, and you would, uh, you would still be observing the same live data, but then every time that live data is updated, you would be uh, invoking this lambda to uh, call a split on this novel, in this entire novel, and then uh, return that as a, another live data, um, which has a list of strings. Um, this is obviously very contrived, but there's 
lots of scenarios where we would actually do this. If you have um, if you have something which isn't using um, a database so that you can't use paging, or if it's not using the web so that you can't use paging. If, for instance, you, you're tied into a Bluetooth scanner and uh, you're trying to do some sort of map operation on everything that comes in. I don't know why that came to my mind. Um, well, there's, there's a really big problem with this in that no novel.split is happening on the main thread. You are now doing a, a CPU bound operation um, on the main thread. How do you get off the main thread? You have to add a ton of code. Um, so the, the live data now that you're getting from the, uh, the live data that you're getting from the repository um, is now separate. It's a different transformation. Um, and uh, then you have to introduce a coroutine scope and uh, well, I, I suppose you could do something with uh, RxJava or uh, Java 8 concurrency, a thread pool or anything, but introduce a coroutine scope. Then you have to do a launch. And then inside that launch, um, you can do all of your work. And at this point, it's now on a background thread. And then you can, min you can update a separate live data um, to do that work or to, to update the UI. So here's, uh, here's the launch. Um, but now on your screen and your fragment or your activity, instead of just observing one live data, now you have to add a second because you're adding something else which is lifecycle aware and uh, that's not really supported with transformations.map. So I should say that uh, this is a little bit fixed in version 2.2 of the uh, live data KTX. Um, that's currently in alpha two. Um, so what you're doing there is, uh, and this is their like awesome coroutine support thing that they have. Um, every live data, uh, observer actually has a coroutine scope. So you use this live data builder, um, which, which adds that coroutine scope. And then you're able to do things on a different thread and then you can use emit to, uh, to update the live data. Emit is now a third way to update your live data um, using a suspend function. And also, you can see here we're using transformations.switchmap. Now you have a switch map extension. This is something they talked about at I.O. Um, they're uh, cleaning up the syntax a little bit. So to sum up live data, um, it is always tied to the main thread. It requires a lifecycle owner. Um, it is observer heavy and that you have to add an observer every single time you add a live data. And uh, it may as well have been written by George R. R. Martin because it takes a year to actually get any updates into production. All right, so now let's talk about coroutines. In order to talk about coroutines, we need to talk about coroutine scope. Um, coroutine scope is kind of uh, like a proxy for lifecycle. Um, within uh, within this API. Um, it's more accurate actually to say that the lifecycle um, informs the coroutine scope about what it's doing. Um, so this is what the coroutine scope inter interface actually looks like. It's um, a single property interface. Um, it just provides a coroutine context. Uh, if you're within it, ice maker. All right, um, <laughs> if you are within a coroutine scope, then you know that you have a context. All right, so let's look at the launch coroutines. Let's look at the launch coroutine scope builder. Um, there's a ton of code here. Um, this is one of several coroutine scope builders, uh, coroutine builders that use coroutine scope. That is, there's also um, provider and uh, async. Um, it's an extension upon coroutine scope and it doesn't actually appear to do anything with the coroutine context. But if you look at this line right here, uh, val new context equals new coroutine scope, new coroutine context, 
Um, what is that doing? Well, that is another extension function upon Coroutine Scope. Um, pretty much everything that actually has anything to do with Coroutine Scope is an extension. Um, and uh, well, look at that line right there. The Coroutine context, um, not the context, but the Coroutine context, um, that is using the Coroutine context from the Coroutine Scope. That is the, uh, the actual property which is provided by the interface. Um, so what that means is, again, uh, the only thing that a coroutine scope is actually good for is ensuring that you are going to have some sort of coroutine context and, I suppose, giving you easy access to it. But um, even stuff which is not an extension upon um, coroutine scope can use the coroutine context from a coroutine scope, um, such as with context, right? Uh, anybody that does anything with coroutines or reads things about coroutines sees with context. And there's no mention here of the, uh, of the coroutine context from coroutine scope. And there's actually no mention of coroutine scope whatsoever. This is a top level function. But what we're doing actually, we'll go back. So this suspend coroutine unintercepted or return, which is the best named function I have ever seen. Um, it provides the continuation, um, which is actually the guts of, of what a coroutine is doing. And that continuation has a reference to the coroutine context. It's only calling it context, but that is the coroutine context. Um, so that is how, no matter where you are, if you're doing something with a, a suspend function or a coroutine scope um, uh, extension function, what you're really doing is uh, what you, what you really care about is that coroutine context provider, because um, that's all the coroutine scope is. It's a coroutine context provider. So what does coroutine context do? Um, it's an interface. It's not this. Um, if you saw my lightning talk a couple of months ago, you know that uh, coroutine context is actually an implementation of something called a type safe heterogeneous map. Um, I'm not going to go into that again. Don't worry, Ryan. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually it's kind of an indexed set, but that's somewhere in between a, a set and the map. Um, but what it really does is it provides you with four different properties, and those properties would be the job, the continuation interceptor, the uh, coroutine exception handler, and the coroutine name. Um, those last two are pretty trivial. Um, it is very rare for someone to actually uh, do a custom implementation of either. Uh, the coroutine name just exists for the purposes of debugging. Um, but this first one, the job, that's how we get coroutine, uh, that's how we get structured concurrency. Um, so essentially, the job is the scope. I've said before that um, I think coroutine scope could actually be refactored to be coroutine provider. And um, we cannot actually do this, but job should have been the thing which got the name of coroutine scope. Um, and we'll go into that here. So say you have some class which implements coroutine scope. Um, and uh, the, the top job from which the entire context is constructed is this job A. Then you have some function, and this function just creates a bunch of coroutines for some reason. It doesn't really matter. Everything is based off of A. Um, when you go through those coroutine builders, um, those are extensions upon this coroutine scope. So uh, the coroutine context being provided is the coroutine context, which uses job A. That job right there. So if we wanted to uh, map out the hierarchy of how we are actually creating jobs here, um, you start with job A, obviously, and then the first thing you do is launch and create B. And then B is creating D, while at the same time um, that function is creating C, and then B is then going to be creating E, while C is creating F. Let's double check that. There you are. We're right. So what happens if we cancel, sorry, yes. Uh, 
So do we mean async task at a high level or async task as in the Android construct of async task? Okay, so um, uh, the polite answer would be that async task is deprecated uh, and you shouldn't use it anymore. It is, um, it's a really good way to create memory leaks. I'm not saying that I would choose that. Right. Yeah, exactly. So um, before coroutines, I was most comfortable with Java 8 concurrency um, with, uh, you know, runnables and callables. Um, and uh, so I like to think of coroutines as a launch or a job. So a launch creates a job and a job is a runnable. Um, not really, but conceptually uh, is what it maps to. And um, async creates a, that's a builder which creates a deferred and the deferred is like the callable in that the callable has a return type. It's, it's a promise or a feature. Um, and uh, so the deferred is like a wrapper, which at some point will be updated with that thing. Whereas the, the runnable or the task or the job is like kind of a null or a void, or sorry, a unit or a void um, operation, which uh, is intended to be fire and forget. That answer your question? Uh, next question. Um, so what happens if we cancel job A? Well, obviously job A is then canceled because we explicitly called cancel on it, but then everything else just dies immediately. Um, that's the entire point of structured concurrency. But then what happens if we cancel B? Right? So B is a child of A and it has child children of its own. Well, only D and E and itself are canceled um, because of that, that nice hierarchy. But now what happens if we have an exception? Um, exception handling in, uh, in coroutines is a little bit inconsistent, uh, but the gist of it is that if you have um, a normal, oops, tip my hand there. If you have a, a, a normal coroutine scope, happening and you have an exception which happens at any point throughout the hierarchy, everything blows up. Um, your entire tree of, of tasks is, is gone, sorry, jobs is gone. And that's where we get something new. Uh, it's called the supervisor scope. So if you create, um, if you define a coroutine scope using the default coroutine scope um, factory function, then you're going to be creating a coroutine scope which uses a job. But if you create a coroutine scope using the main scope factory function, then it's going to use a supervisor job and it's going to use dispatchers.main, which is not something that we've talked about yet, but it's a thing. Um, incidentally, um, view model scope, which is part of live data, or sorry, lifecycle components 2.1, which is I think in RC1 now, um, that uses, it initially used a job and the main dispatcher, and they have since updated it to use the supervisor job and the main dispatcher. So let's see what that does, or why we bothered. So here's what we had before. You make one simple change, that job becomes a supervisor job. And since everything is based off of that, we have one supervisor job only at the topmost level. And then if we throw an exception at, uh, at job D, what it does is that it, it, it goes up to its parent and cancels the parent and then all other jobs within that hierarchy, but it does not go all the way up. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't blow up your entire, your entire app, your entire workflow. Um, all of the other coroutines still continue. So what we've seen from that, oh, right, we're talking about something else first. So um, what we did here is that we implemented coroutine scope, right? Um, this is something which I've actually been pretty vocal about not doing, um, hence this slide, uh, and here's why. So let's say you have a class which is a, a file parser, right? Um, and uh, it implements coroutine scope 
for now um, because it's going to be doing some kind of asynchronous stuff. Let's say it gets a bunch of files actually and then wants to process them in parallel and then, I don't know, make, make it up. Um, so it's going to be doing some asynchronous stuff and we, we want to use coroutines, so we're going to implement coroutines code. So this is maybe how you would use it in some other class. You would, uh, you would, you know, create an instance of a file parser and pass in a, a file which you wanted to uh, to parse, and then you'd call dot parse, and that's great, and that's fine, and that's the intended usage, and everybody can go on their happy way. But there's nothing stopping you from doing this, right? Since that file parser implements coroutine scope. You can initialize your file parser and then not use it to parse or do whatever it else, whatever else is uh, implemented in that class. Instead, you can use it as a coroutine scope. Um, the contract of the coroutine scope has nothing whatsoever to do with the functionality of that class, right? That class exists so that you can parse files. Um, so it should not be part of the contract of that class. So what you can do instead is uh, make the scope just a property of the class, then it's safe and it's an implementation detail which is not exposed elsewhere. And, oh, and then you get your nice squiggly line. I tried to try to make it look like, like an IDE thing. If you want to read more about that, um, I wrote an article, um, why a class shouldn't, probably shouldn't implement coroutine scope, and there's the link to it. Um, I'll share all of my slides at the end. So, since we don't want to implement coroutine scope um, as, as part of the class's contract, what do we do instead? Well, we have to create factories for it. Well, we want to create factories because we're going to be making lots of coroutine scopes. And we also want to use supervisor jobs instead of regular jobs. If you wanted to use a regular job, you could just use coroutine scope. It already exists. Coroutine scope, the factory, not coroutine scope, the interface. Or coroutine scope, the, the other function. But so. You can make a function, factory function, supervisor scope. It would still take in um, a continuation interceptor, also known as a dispatcher, with a default argument. Um, but it would always, as the job, provide a supervisor job. Um, then we can make this a little bit more convenient. Instead of uh, always having to pass in a uh, a type of dispatcher, if uh, you know what type of dispatcher, well, you know that you only have a few options for dispatchers. There's main, there's IO, there's default, and there's um, uh, unconfined, which nobody actually uses. But you can just enumerate those in individual factory functions, and uh, then instead of having to pass in arguments, you can just have one single convenient thing. Um, incidentally, if you're using um, dependency injection or a service locator uh, with qualifiers, then this allows you to, in your constructors or whatever, um, annotate your, your coroutine scope with the qualifier of the type of scope which you would like to provide, and then map that with a, uh, um, a provider function or a bind function, which um, gives you that exact scope so that you can specify all of that uh, for your normal production code and then override it for testing. So um, what's the version of coroutines for live data? I, I started all of this out by talking about how terrible live data is, and clearly I'm going to be suggesting something as, as an alternative. What is that suggestion? Um, how do we replace our live data implementations with something else? Live data pretty much maps to a broadcast channel. Um, so that begs the question, what is a channel? Um, a channel is an observable type provided by the Coroutines API. Um, it is a linked blocking queue, which is thread safe, concurrency safe. Um, you can have multiple Coroutines updating it at the same time, and you have a guarantee of processing them in order. Um, they call it a synchronization primitive. Um, which I suppose it is, it actually uses a mutex and it can't be a primitive if it uses a primitive, but that's okay. Um, and it allows the sender and the receiver for the coroutine, that would be the, 
the emitter, the observer, they have different coroutine scopes. Um, at no point here are you tied to a single thread. So what does that actually look like? Um, let's take this horrible example, um, a horribly useless example. So this function talks to itself. We start out by creating a channel um, just of integers. Um, since I don't have an argument, um, there's, a, there's an optional argument for size, and I haven't included that here, so it's a rendezvous channel. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And we have to create a, a, a new job. We have to launch um, because the send function is actually a suspending function. So if we didn't invoke launch, if we tried to do this on a single thread, then the entire function would just deadlock. Um, so we use a scope, we use the cartoon scope, and we perform a launch, um, and uh, we just obviously send 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Then to receive that, we, uh, well, we create a mutable list just to store the data, but then the uh, receiving it looks just like it's a normal for loop, right? Because channel, receive channel actually implements iterator. So um, under the hood, we do a for each, and then it's calling a, a function called consume, which takes the, the first element in the queue and reports it, removing it, and then moving on. So what this looks like, since as I said, it's a, it's a rendezvous channel, and we'll talk about that in a second, um, we're going to send zero, and then we're gonna receive zero, and send one and receive one, and so on. Um, in this suspending function where all of the sends happen before, but they're actually happening at the same time. It's pretty neat. So that is all happening by virtue of something which they refer to as a buffer. Uh, it's back pressure, right? Um, channels hold their data until it is, con is received or consumed. Um, but unlike live data, um, you can you have some options there, some config options as to how you're going to be doing the, uh, the back pressure. So the first one would be a rendezvous channel. Um, rendezvous has a capacity kind of zero, kind of one. Um, it only holds one element. You send one, you can't send another one until that first one is actually consumed. Um, second option would be linked list. This is the exact opposite. It's an infinite cache. You can send um, as many elements as you would like with no consumers whatsoever. And as soon as you add a consumer, um, everything will come out in order synchronously. Um, the third option would be an array um, where you pass in the size. It's the exact same as the rendezvous channel, except that you can set a capacity. So if you set a capacity of say three, you can send zero, one, two, and then when you try to send three, it will actually suspend until something has consumed that first element, at which point it'll send three normally and so on and so forth. And then fourth is conflated. So conflated, um, it's like a live data. Um, it'll hold exactly one element at any time. Um, you can read it multiple times. It does not get consumed and removed as the other channels do. Um, and yeah, pretty much exactly the same as the live data. Except that you can use different coroutine scopes and different threads and you're not locked into main thread. So um, that's how you receive data pretty much, but uh, we have two different options for how to emit data. Um, as I said, the first one is suspend, or sorry, send, which is a suspend function. Um, send allows you to uh, make sure if, you, if you've got some function doing, you know, three different things and uh, step one is sending that data to the, to the channel um, and step two relies upon that data having been sent to the channel, uh, you will not be able to proceed if you use send until that channel has actually received it. Um, on the other hand, uh, offer, it's a fire and forget. You can uh, attempt to send it to the channel, and if the channel is full, that's it. It's lost. You lose your data. Uh, it's really convenient if you know these 
specific environment that you're working in and uh, you know that you will always have a consumer and it's, it's not going to be a problem. So moving on, broadcast channels. What I said earlier was that the live data is the same as a conflated broadcast channel, sorry, a, a conflated broadcast channel. Um, a normal channel only allows for one observer. If you have multiple, sorry, one observer to receive the data. If you have multiple reservers, observers, it is uh, kind of random which one is actually going to get the data that's emitted. Um, and that's bad if, you're, if you've got some global state that you're trying to observe from multiple, multiple places, only one's going to receive it. And that's why we have the broadcast channel. So all a broadcast channel is, is uh, a container for multiple received channels. Um, you, can, you can observe a broadcast channel directly, um, which you shouldn't, and that's actually something the API shouldn't allow. But uh, you can also use open subscription to create a channel um, which guarantees your own copy of all data which is sent to that channel, at which point it just becomes the same as any other channel. So um, for broadcast channels, we have a, a smaller uh, option, smaller number of options for um, buffer types. We have the array, which is the exact same as it was before. Um, and then we have conflated, which we already mentioned. But there is no rendezvous channel, and there's no linked list channel. So there's no infinite cache. Um, there's uh, just a lot of logic that goes behind having um, uh, multiple receivers and a limited capacity. Um, like, how do you negotiate, oh, well, I've got two channels open, and this one channel has... Um, has uh, received three of the properties, but the other channel is doing something that's suspending for a while and it's only got one. So I had to kind of simplify it. So I've mentioned receive channel and uh, send channel. Um, what are they? Well, so one of them only receives and the other one only sends. Um, and channel and broadcast channel implement both of them. Uh, so this is really similar to um, having a live data versus immutable live data or a list versus immutable list. Um, if you want to only expose, um, uh, you know, an immutable stream of data to some class, then, uh, you know, you can do the, well, you can do that, um, which is what we saw earlier with the live data. So I've talked about how all of this stuff works uh, in the back end, but what we really want to know is that how, how can you observe data from a channel? Um, this is not something which is included in the, uh, in the coroutines library. Um, I'm not sure why. Actually, I'm going to tangent. So there's a, uh, there's a great talk from uh, Pierre Ivory Co about uh, human-centered API design. And uh, it was at... Uh, DroidCon New York last year, as well as DroidCon San Francisco. He talks about, for a while, he talks about um, intuition, intuition as programmers. Um, and he says that uh, uh, nothing is intuitive in a vacuum, right? Um, all the stuff that we would all consider to be uh, intuitive um, is based upon all of our experiences um, as, as developers. Um, and uh, because of that, we, we have a tendency to flock towards uh, API designs which make sense to us. Um, and I'm seeing that a lot with coroutines right now. Um, this, uh, if you've, aside from the architecture component stuff, if you read anything whatsoever from uh, JetBrains about coroutines, you're going to hear about flow. And even the terminology which they use in flow, um, points to uh, how, how based in RxJava it is, um, right? The idea is that, uh, well, okay, so last week Jake tweeted, Jake Warden tweeted that uh, uh, Flow has 90% of the functionality that RxJava has. Um, Flow is designed in such a way that if you want to treat coroutines like they are RxJava, then you can use Flow. Um, 
and and if you guys watch the uh, the coroutines repo, you see so many feature requests where people will explicitly say, like we have in Rx Java, you know, all these different operators building in all of this functionality to make one API look like another API. Well, I've never used Rx Java ever. Um, actually, when we uh, when we made the decision to go with coroutines, it was a conversation about coroutines versus Rx Java, and we. We obviously made the choice we made. Um, but uh, what I have been using um, quite a lot is live data. And um, what it would appear the rest of the industry has been using quite a lot is live data. You see, um, like I said, all of these uh, articles about you know, how to implement the latest and greatest architecture with coroutines and live data. Well, um, what we're trying to do is get rid of the live data, but keep all the same functionality or maybe improve upon it um, by, uh, by using coroutines instead. So that's what we're doing here. Um, we wrote, getting back to the slides, thanks. Uh, uh, we wrote an extension function um, on a receive channel. Now again, receive channel is uh, implemented by, by channel and broadcast channel. And uh, it's able to do everything that you do with the live data because you pass in the uh, coroutine scope and that coroutine scope can act as a proxy for, uh, for your life cycle, for the life cycle owner, life cycle provider's life cycle, the, the life cycle that you would have in your screen. Um, and then you, you pass in a lambda, which is an extension upon a coroutine scope, but which returns um, unit and then you create a launch, you, you perform a launch, you create a job uh, using the coroutine scope, which was provided by the observer. So this, like everything that this function is actually doing is now tied not to the channel, wherever this channel might be. Let's say it's in your view model. Um, you're saying, your screen is saying like view model dot my, my channel dot observe. Um, it's got no ties whatsoever to that view model. It's got ties to the observer, to the screen. Or this could be in a repository, and the observer is the view model, and the view model is passing in its scope, but there are no ties. Um, so with this launch, we're observing asynchronously, like the, the function finishes right away. It's a fire and forget thing. Um, and if, this co if the coroutine scope is canceled, like we saw with that hierarchy tree, um, that's redundant, with that tree, um, if the, if the coroutine scope is canceled, if the job is canceled, then the job stops. So we're not doing any, any observing anymore and there's no leaks. So here's an example of how to implement it. You've got some class which has a repository and that repository exposes a channel. Um, you can, I don't like doing things in init blocks, but it makes it fit on a slide. So then in your init block, um, again, you just pass in the scope and you can, you can consume everything which happens to that channel. Um, but it's, it's not a, it's a nice unidirectional data flow. The, the repository knows nothing about where it's coming from. Um, so, it looks like you're, you're observing a live data, right? Like it's actually, except that in this case, since I'm not implementing coroutine scope, I'm, I have an implementation of it, a property. I'm not passing in this, but if I passed in, if I had implemented coroutine scope and I passed in this instead of scope, that would look identical to a live data and it would perform identically to a live data. And, um, Thing is, with 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 live data, um, what what implements lifecycle owner or lifecycle owner scope or lifecycle provider? Um, only screens, right? Your your fragments do and your activities. Um, what can what can create a coroutine scope? Literally anything. So um, if you're using um, if you're using this method of observing a channel with a, with a coroutine scope, you can do this without any coupling to the weirdness that is Android um, at all. So there's a big problem in uh, the way that 
everyone does uh, cancellation of a life cycle of a coroutine scope. Um, we've seen this since, uh, I guess, since DroidCon New York last year, or maybe uh, maybe Kotlin Conf, where in a view model, you would initialize a coroutine scope right away because most people just implement coroutine scope in view model, which they shouldn't do. Um, and then you cancel the coroutine scope in uncleared, right? But when is uncleared actually called? So if you have a screen, it creates a view model, and then the screen has a button, and you click on that button, which takes you to another screen, and that first screen is put in the back stack, uncleared is not called. So any coroutines which were running when everything was in the foreground are going to continue running while that screen is in the back stack. And if that's something which happened in you know, main activity and um, it's like uh, you know, periodically updating or whatever, um, that's gonna run for the life cycle of your app, um, which is not good. So, um, and that is exactly actually what's, what's happening in view model scope. Um, in version 2.1 RC1 of, um, of live data, of lifecycle. I predict we're gonna see that in production at uh, Dev Summit. So in, uh, in view model scope, it's initialized the first time you use it, just lazily, and then it's canceled in, in uncleared or undestroyed. Um, that's a huge leak. Um, and uh, this is better in 2.2 for, um, life cycle scope, I think they call it. Um, in screens, the uh, the coroutine scope, which they're creating using in KTX, is actually tied to the life cycle of the screen. And you have utility functions, which are really, really great, called uh, like when resumed and when paused and when created and all that stuff. Um, uh, so you can, at any point you want, like maybe in an init block, um, declare that you know the next time some life cycle event happens, this stuff is going to happen. And if you've got some function, like say you have a launch in um, that you have scheduled to, to happen at on resume, and that launch happens forever, like it's a you know delay long dot max value or something. Um, if the screen is paused, that actually gets stuck into a queue and then automatically resumed. So 2.2 lifecycle owner scope, going to be really awesome. Um, still has problems though. So uh, here's how we're fixing it at Milwaukee Tool. Um, first of all, we have some activities that we actually do coroutine things in and other customizations, um, and we have fragments. And we don't like writing utility functions for both when it's the exact same logic. So we implemented a, uh, we created an interface called screen, which You've already read it by now. It has a lifecycle owner and it has a coroutine scope. And uh, if we just declare that as an implementation for both types of screen, then it just automatically works. And we can then write extensions upon one interface instead of two different classes. It's just a nice quality of life thing. So what we did was uh, this giant function, which I'm gonna break down piece by piece, called while resumed. Might want to rename it to every resume, uh, but this function just takes um, a, a single uh, extension upon coroutine scope, which returns a job. So I didn't actually mention this earlier. Um, the deferred type, which is returned by the async builder, actually implements job or extends extends job. So um, you could have this return a deferred, and it would still return to job. But um, what this means is uh, you take a Lambda, which does a launch, basically. Um, and then you have a, a job variable, which is nullable. And then you create an actual observer. This is the lifecycle observer. This is also dramatically improved upon the syntax of it in 2.2, but we're not gonna see that until IO next year. Um, but all this does is that uh, in onResume, you invoke that lambda to create a job and assign that to the job variable. And then, of course, in on pause, you cancel that job. That's fine because the next time you resume, it's going to be recreated. 
And then, of course, if you forget to add the observer, which is something that I did, it's not going to work. Um, and that's the only slide I have for that. So um, what this means is that in your, I should go back, um, in your screens now, in your fragments, in your activities, or dialogue fragments, um, or custom views, uh, in an init block, you can do it immediately. You can say, every time I resume, kick off an observer. And then every time I pause, it'll kill that observer. And uh, then you can same, follow that same functionality with view models or any other class you'd like. Uh, if you wanted to make it uh, lifecycle aware, if uh, you have presenters or custom components or reducers or uh, you know any of the different uh, architectures that kids are using nowadays. Um, and in doing this, you have less leaky coroutines than you do in any other implementation I've ever seen. Um, and uh, you have completely removed the need for live data, unless you're using data binding, which I didn't think about until now. But don't use data binding, because you're better than that. Um, so next we're going to talk about, actually last, we're going to talk about um, adding coroutines to things which are not coroutinable. Um, let's say you have um, an API call, which you're not using the latest and greatest version of retrofit. Um, it, it takes a normal callback, and you want to be able to make that into a coroutine. How would you do that? Um, first, you would create a deferred object, um, which is a completable deferred um, of the type that you want to be returning. And then you would actually enqueue your web call. And then you're immediately going to be returning that deferred object. That, that deferred is not complete, and it has no data in it. Um, but uh, that's OK, because when your web request finishes, um, I'm playing a little loose here with retrofit. Obviously, you're going to want to parse and make sure that the, the body is not null and uh, have exception handling and all that. But I got to fit this on a slide. So um, you know, if you get a response, you're going to complete the deferred with that response, otherwise you pass in null. Um, and then in some class where you're trying to consume your repository's output, um, look at that. It looks just like a normal coroutine. If you were using an async builder, um, it would look exactly like this. Uh, so this is, oh, yeah, exactly the same. This is exactly what Jake did in his uh, uh, coroutine adapter that he wrote for retrofit a little bit over a year ago um, that is now deprecated um, the uh, in retrofit 2.6 we have official coroutine support where you can add suspend modifiers to your uh, service interfaces and because it's a suspend like a legitimate suspend and uh, retrofit is aware of the coroutine scope all the way down to the lowest level. Um, it's a little bit more efficient now. If you cancel your web requests, they are actually immediately canceled, whereas with a completable deferred, um, the web request will actually still finish, and you just won't know about it. Um, but if you've got something like anything with a callback, and you can't just rewrite it to use an async or a, or a suspend function, then uh, that's what you do, completable deferred, completable dot or deferred dot complete and then await in your uh, in your call stack and that is it for the actual slides thank you very much um, Twitter Arbasaro slack Arbasaro medium Arbasaro um, and my name is Rick Passaro and uh, let's open this up to questions yes. Recreated. So, um, uh, coroutine scope is on or off. Um, if you if you cancel a coroutine scope, then or, or a job, then that's that. But if you have the that lambda, that lambda is the definition of how to create it. So you just create another one. Yeah. So, yes. If this was. Um, I don't know, computing pi, 
to a thousand decimals or something, then um, uh, you would lose your stuff and you just need to stay on that screen. Uh, at that point, you'd want to implement some sort of call stack um, and you'd want to use uh, suspend cancelable coroutines instead of just jobs. This particular implementation was built specifically for just observing a channel. So, yeah, yeah, right. Any other questions? Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you very much.